Hey, how's it going guys? My name's Daniel, aka Hashlips, and welcome back to the video where I'm gonna show you how to code a dApp from scratch. In the previous video, we've created a dApp using Remix, and now it's on the test network. Now we're going to set up the dApp from scratch, connect it to MetaMask and the blockchain to interact with it, to create a page like Rarity Tools. It's going to be super fun. So let's get started. If you want to learn how to write the contract itself that we are going to be using, watch the video before this one. That's what we exactly did and now we're going to build the dApp part only and hook it up to our contract that's living on the test network on the blockchain. Now a bit of cleanup and what you need to do the prerequisite is firstly go ahead and download node.js. You can download this for your operating system and this is simply the framework that we'll need to run some of the commands. Next, you'll need a great IDE. I recommend Visual Studio Code, I always use it and it's a great tool. For those of you who are new to coding, an IDE is simply a text editor that helps facilitate you writing code and it also allows us to run interesting commands in a built-in terminal and that's why we want to use it. If you are struggling in any way, go to hashtips.online and go and visit our Discord or Telegram channels. There you'll get tons of help from people who are devs who has already done the process and they're more than willing to help you out. Lastly, go and leave a like and a comment in this video before we start because I can promise you, you will learn a lot. We can jump right in. So go ahead and open Visual Studio Code once you've downloaded. Then go and click at the terminal here right at the top and say new terminal. I want you to run node-v to check the version. If a version pops up, it means that you also have node installed correctly. That's the only prerequisites you will need. Now, what we're going to do is you're going to click on open to open a new folder, go to any place. I'm gonna to go to my desktop and create a new folder. I'm gonna call it NFT hunt, like so. NFT hunt or NFT rarity tool, like so. Then open that up. I'm going to say I trust this. And now we can see that we are inside that folder. We can also see that that folder exists on our desktop. And here it is. It's empty at the moment. But we are going to populate it with a very special command. And this command will create a React application for us. And yes, I did mention React. Don't freak out. Even if you don't really know React or programming, you can still kind of follow along. It would be beneficial if you already know tools like React and programming, HTML, CSS in general, and just want to up your skills. So if you really don't feel comfortable at this stage, go ahead and YouTube uh, create a React application or a bit of HTML, CSS. I will create those videos in the future. But in this video, I purely want to focus on the fact that we are going to hook up a dApp to the blockchain. And that is what we want to achieve. We are going to focus on a bit of CSS and you'll get to learn a new tricks, uh, tips and tricks of the trade. Um, but apart from that, it is going to be a lot of tech heavy stuff. So if you are a beginner, this might not be the right video. But that being said, you guys know that I explain stuff very thoroughly. So if you want to stick through and try the challenge, then go ahead. I will try my best to explain everything step by step. This is the React framework that we are going to be using. It's written by Facebook and it's a great tool to use when writing HTML pages. It has a great way of state management, which we'll use in this tutorial. I'll talk a little bit about React as we go along so that you can get used to the nuances that it has and the best practices when it comes to React and how to use it. I'm not going to take it too slow, but you'll get the gist of it as we go along. So to get started, and the best way to get started is actually to use a tool that's written an NPM script that will initiate a React application for you just by running this command. So simply write npx 
Now, NPX is used so that you don't have to physically download a lot of libraries and it will go and fetch it from the cloud. So you need internet access. NPX create dash react dash app space and then give it a name. Seeing that we are going to be listing drops, I'm just going to call it NFT underscore drop underscore app like so. And now hit enter. What this will do is pull down a base project for us to use. Once we've pulled it down, we can now install the dependencies and then go ahead and start our application. You will see that it creates a new folder in there. Now we have to navigate inside this folder, even though we have created a folder outside, which is called NFT Rarity Tool, inside the NFT Drop app has just been created. It's going to take a while, so let it run. And then once it's done, once we go to reopen Visual Studio Code inside of that folder. Once it's done, you'll see the terminal looking like this, giving us a few suggestions what we can do to start our project off. Now, I'm just going to teach you the commands. They are saying you need to use yarn, but you can use npm as well. So what we're going to do now is just simply say file, open, and just open that folder that you just created. The reason why we do this is so that the terminal that is built in points to this folder instead of you navigating in the terminal. So now go ahead again and say terminal, new terminal up there. Now you can see that node modules was already installed for us. So we don't need to do that again. All we have to do now is simply run npm run start. Once we do this, um, this program will actually start up the base application for us. And that is great. This means that it's going to spin up a local host and then host our application. This is kind of similar to hosting your website on a hosting service, but you can see that it's lo locally hosted over here at port 3000. And this is the basic DAP. It has a spinning React logo, some text, and a link. And we can go and explore the project, and that's what we are going to do now so that you can get the base understanding of React. Let's take a brief look at the folder structure that we got when running Create React App. Now, you can see that at the very bottom we have four files. This is a yarn.lock file, which is generated whenever dependencies are installed if you are using yarn. So don't pay too much attention to this file. It's just going to be generated if you were using yarn. Similarly, there will be a package.lock file if you used npm. So we didn't install any dependencies. We simply ran the command. So the command ran yarn. Then we get the readme file, which has to do with source control and GitHub, which we're not going to get into, but it's really not important to fiddle around with any of these files. Then we get the package.json file. Now this file is super important for any node based project. It basically governs what dependencies it needs to install by providing it a dependency list, as well as some other configurations to do with the app execution. You can also put some scripts in here to run in the terminal to execute certain things. But that being said, after it installs dependencies, where do those dependencies get saved? For instance, where does the React DOM, React, React scripts get saved? Well, that is in the node underscore modules folder. This folder is something that you also don't need to worry about. It's simply a place where node manages and saves its modules. The git ignore file is also something that we can technically ignore because we are not going to be making use of source control. If you are an experienced programmer, then obviously you know what these files are for and you can go ahead and use them. All that we need to worry about in this course is basically the SRC folder as well as the public. We might look at the public. Let me briefly go over what these two files are. So the public folder is there to tell us what files it needs to incorporate in the final build of your static HTML web app. Now, you usually specify things like the logos, the initial HTML document that you need to specify and give some descriptions. 
um, some name tags you can change the title tag in here but essentially these things come standard and you don't need to really um, change a lot in here the only things that you do need to change are the logos because you don't want the react logo you can maybe change it into your own logos um, and then in the manifest file this has to do with pwa apps so this might um, host the content that might be saved when you are offline but that is very technical so we won't get into that in this course and we will be mostly focusing on the src folder structure now this is going to be our safe haven where we're going to explore and write some code the src file or the folder structure basically contains all the code needed to basically execute the app and i'm going to go through these files quickly one by one so you also understand what the base project gives us immediately you can see some kind of structure happening over here we can see that we have got an app.css app.js and app.test.js this means that these three files are related this one provides the style the .css the .js provides the logic the functionality of our component because react is component driven and then the app.test is there to facilitate us with some tests to make sure that the logic works of that component here we get a similar uh, fashion we get the index.css and the index.js now the index.js is going to be the entry point of our application and we'll go through that in detail just now next we get a logo.svg and this logo is basically if we go to chrome is this spinning one over here but just jumping back quickly we are going to remove some of the stuff that we don't need and the reason why i want to do that is to show you that you can manipulate react to how you want it to work lastly the report web vitals and the setup test this is basically to do with the pwa and the test that we just discussed we're not going to cover testing in this course so i can also go ahead and remove some of the test uh, files that is presented over here for now i'm going to go ahead and delete this file the setup i'm also going to delete the report web vitals i'm going to delete the uh, logo.svg and then i'm also going to go ahead and let me just see delete this test now that i've done that i can see that i've got two app files and two index files left now we also have an error and it basically says that it cannot find or open a directory the logo.svg and that is true because we just removed it a nice way of debugging is that we can see where it's being used by going to the app.js uh, file and see that here at the top line number one it says import the logo svg we're going to remove that line and save the file then we can see that the web um, the report web vitals can also not be found so let's go to the index.js and remove that too we're also going to have to remove this once we save it we can see that our app is now running again but most probably won't have the logo so if we refresh we can see that now logo is not defined so we can jump back to the app go into app.js where that was being used and then we need to remove it it was sitting underneath this image tag so there you can see it was using source logo so i'm going to remove that save then navigate back and you can see the logo is gone this looks pretty bare boned already but let's go ahead and strip out some more elements so that we can start with a clean slate so go back to the code and let's start off by looking at the index.js now like i said this is the entry point of your uh, app and you can see that here at the top there's a few imports files and dependencies that this program needs for whatever is going to be used down here we can see that we are making use of react react dom as well as the index.css this file now 
in the index.css, we can see that the body and this get some fonts. Now we're going to go ahead and delete this file. So delete that like so. And also in the index.js, remove this import. Otherwise it will break. Then you can see something interesting is happening. We are importing app and app is sitting over here. If we look at app.js, we can see right at the bottom, we are exporting this component. A component structure simply looks like a function if you're using functional based components. Now, after importing the app, they basically use it like an HTML tag. And this is the root, then they append it to the root element of this web page. And basically, the app is our entry point via the index.js. When I was learning React for the very first time, I got confused by thinking that I need to nest these components. And that is simply not the case. So, to help you along with your beginning journey, I'm going to prove to you that if you go to the app.js, which has this component, and you can see some resemblance. You can see the text and learn react uh, link over there, which you can see is displayed on the page. If we go ahead and take the component structure, this div, and we copy it, we can even cut it out if we want to, but let's just copy it, go to index.js, paste it where the app should be, and then going removing the app, you can see that our app will still work. That is because technically our index.js only serves as a pass through and simply renders everything inside the app component, which is all of the stuff anyway. It's a way to structure the component much better because imagine we had to write all the code in the index.js and this is how componentizing works in React. I'm going to dive into it a little bit deeper so you fully understand it. Now that you have seen that the index.js simply serves as our pass through the entry to our app, we don't really need to work on this file a lot. We can simply focus on whatever is inside the app.js component. Now, this tutorial, I won't show in depth components and how to structure and create new components and save them and then render them. But what I will do is explain how a component works. So let's take a basic look at what we do over here. All it is is a function. Now forget about this render part for now. This is the basics of a component, a functional component. It looks like this. And you can even forget about this import. All it is is a function called app. We can call it anything. So we can call this any app as well, as long as we export any app there. And then in index, we need to now obviously import any app from any, well, it's still called app. So we don't say any app there. This is the file name, but we want to import our any app and we want to render the any app. I'm going to save this, but technically nothing is going to get rendered now. If I go into my component structure and return, right? So we return something and for our use case, I took away all the styling as well. So we might as well also delete the app.js file. So let's delete that. And now we can just simply render a P tag like HTML and let's go say hello. Hello world. When we save this and we go back to our app, you can see if we refresh, there's hello world with a blank page because there's no styling on this page. And this is what we're going to start off with. We are going to strip everything away like we've done and now start off with a clean slate. Perfect. So instead of just renaming this file, let's create one from scratch and then import it in our index.js file. We're going to right click and say new file underneath the SRC folder and let's call it our drop uh, list. So this is going to be the drop list.js. Once I have this, I can create a new function. So instead of specifying it like this, 
I'm going to write it in the new is, um, you know, six way. So const drop list like so. And this drop list is going to be equal to an anonymous function like so. There we go. And this is going to return to us like we've done something. And for now, I'm just going to create an empty div tag like so. And then at the bottom, we need to export this. Now you can see that the exports work like this. If you export something by default, you can simply import it straight off the bat, giving it a name. Otherwise, you can also have named exports, um, which we'll get to. But for now, we can simply go and see we need to export the default. So let's type in export default and then our drop list. And there we go. We've created a very simple component. Now I'm just going to maybe in here just for reference also put a P tag. And uh, if you don't know HTML, this is HTML. Uh, I'm just going to write it there. And then we need to import this. So let's go to our index and rather import the drop list. So we're going to say we want to import drop list from where is it located? Well, it's simply just located here. When you specify an import, you do not append the .js. It's not necessary. Now that we have this, check what will happen if I just simply put this drop list underneath my other component, any app. If I save this, remember we had hello world. Now we will have hello world and HTML because there's two components. This is an example of how you would split components into different ones, creating a header, a body, and I'll, we'll get to that as well. But this is the start of it. We're not going to need any app because I want my drop list to be the main list because it's going to be a simple app. Then for my app.js, I'm going to remove it. Now we get a very basic application. We got our entry point, which is the index.js and then our drop list component. To follow a bit better convention, in the SRC folder, I'm going to create a new folder and call it components. In the components folder, I'm going to drag my drop list.js and move it there. Then I need to update wherever I've imported it. This wants to automatically do this, which I'm just going to say no for now and just show you that in order to import this, we need to say components and then drop list. That means that we are going to find it in the components folder. Because if your component or your app grows uh, with a lot of components, you'll need some place to save it. It is just a simple structure, structures we can get into. It's a whole different subject. But for now, just do this and at least you'll know that it's a bit more structured. Everything is ready for us to now connect to MetaMask and start actually our dApp. Because currently this is a normal web page. It has nothing to do with the blockchain at all. Now we're going to import some libraries that we are going to need in order for us to make a connection to the blockchain through MetaMask. And we're going to import the Web3 library so we can interact with our contract. This is going to come up next. So just a reminder, leave a thumbs up on this video if you are enjoying the content. Also, if you want to subscribe. Now we have to connect to the blockchain and retrieve the data from our contract living on the Ethereum network. How can we achieve this? Well, it's important to understand how the connection to the blockchain works and what parts are needed to achieve our goal. The two things we're going to need is Web3.js, which is a JavaScript Ethereum library API, right? It is a library that provides us a set of tools in order for us to interact smoothly with the Ethereum blockchain, um, contracts, accounts, and all those kind of things. Now, the web3.js allows for us to connect to the blockchain, but it does not give us the provider, so to speak. We still get to manipulate that part and choose which provider we want to use. What better provider to use than MetaMask? It is a browser extension and they are running the full Ethereum nodes 
and they give us access to connect to the blockchain. So we can pass MetaMask as the provider to the Web3.js library, meaning that the Web3 library will basically create that connection using MetaMask. Then we can create an instance of our contract and we can work with it. That is pretty cool. Now there is other services like Infura, um, there's a bunch of them. And you can also do a full node on your own and then you know connect via that. But the simplest for me to explain is the two parts you'll need is the web3.js library as well as a provider that you're going to be using to connect to the blockchain. Let's go and set this all up, but let's first download uh, web3.js, the dependency we'll need in our React app. So now what we want to do is actually create that connection to the blockchain. So for that, we will need the web3 library. Let's go ahead and install this. For a brief second, I'm going to hit control and then C. This will exit the program. Now I can run the NPM script again. So I'm going to run NPM install like so, and then I'm going to say web three. We need to install web three in order for us to use the tools to connect to the blockchain via uh, MetaMask, which is going to be our provider. While this is installing, let's go ahead and create a space for us to save the information we will need to connect to our contract. I'm going to create a new folder and call this contract. Then in here, I'm going to create a file and call it contract.json, like so. In the JSON, I'm going to start my JSON and list the address like so this is going to be equal to something and we also need the ABI so where do we get the ABI well we can go to our browser go to etherscan and click on the contract address this is the creators address so let's go back on the contract address um, over here click on contract and then scroll down to the bottom and there's your ABI so go ahead and copy the whole thing go back to Visual Studio Code and then simply paste it now when I save it it organizes nicely because I have Prettier installed on Visual Studio Code now this is the ABI basically telling us what the blueprint is of our contract we still need the address. So how we get that is again by going back and then copying this address here at the top. This is the location of where this contract lives. So go and put that in there. Perfect. Now that we have this, we can import it in our drop list file. To import the contract, simply go here to the top and let's create some space. I'm going to write the keyword import and then we can specify a contract like that. And then we need to say, where are we going to import this from? Now we're going to specify that we have to go directory back and then go into the contract folder, followed by typing in contract.json. Perfect. And that's exactly where we want to import this from. We can run a test by just console.logging this out. So if we type in console.log and then logging out the contract itself like so, we will see if we've done this correctly. Let's go and run the program seeing that the install is also complete. So we can go ahead and run npm run start and this will start up our development server again running the application. This time if I say inspect by right clicking I can see in the console there's an object that was printed and there we can see the ABI as well as our address. Now we will need the Web3 library. So I'm also going to import that. So I'm going to import Web3 from and then simply specify Web3 like this. This will give us the actual library which we're going to create an instance from. We are also going to need to use state. Now in React, you can use the use state hook. 
when you use um, functional based components in React, you can use hooks. Hooks are simply functions that return a, an altered state, so to speak. The use state hook is very unique and how you would use it is something like this. Let me give you a small counter example. When you want to create a counter, let's specify it like this. Let's specify a variable and call it counter. This time, I'm going to wrap it in brackets like so. I'm also going to put a set counter variable like this. And then I'm going to equal this to the use state that we've imported there at the top and set it to zero. Let me show you how simple use state really is. The first variable is the actual value and the second one is the function that will alter this value. So to explain it a bit better, let's create a new p tag right here below our HTML. What we can do is put curly braces indicating to React that this is going to be a dynamic value and we can put in anything in here. But I want to put my counter. So if I save this and go to that web app, we can see there's a zero. Exactly what we've specified over there as the initial state. If we want to use the set counter to set the state, every time state updates in React, the screen basically re-renders that component. This means that we can set the counter dynamically and in real time. For example, let's change the HTML to click me. Now this is going to say click me. Let's add a click handler. So I'm going to say on click like so and specify a function to run. The function that I wanted to run is actually the set counter. And we are going to pass in the new value that we want this to be. And the value is going to be our counter and let's say plus one. This will in turn add to the counter one and then set the state. Let's save this, go to our app and then click on this counter. So click me increments our state. And that's how we're going to be working with state, saving the contract as well as the web three instance and then connecting to the blockchain and then saving it all in state so that we can work with it. Now that you know how basic state works in React, I guess we can go ahead and connect to MetaMask. I'm going to alter the state that we have here currently, but I'm going to do it a bit differently. I'm going to create a constant value and we're going to call this the initial, um, let's call it info. And this is going to be equal to an object. Now the initial info is going to be the object of values that I want to initialize over here. So let's go ahead and change the counter into info and the set counter into set info. Then we're going to say this should start off with our initial state. It's good to have an object here because the thing is, if we want to set this to the initial state again, it's easy for us to do so. We're going to need a few variables in here. And the first one is going to be um, connected and that's going to be false. Then we're going to need a new one and let's call it the status. This can be an empty string or let's make it even null. Then let's create one for the account, which is also going to be null. This account is going to be the account that's currently connected to our web app. I have to have a variable for the contract, which is going to be null as well. The address. And this is optional because we technically have the address from our contract over there. So probably not too necessary. So let's get rid of that one. And that's about it. So we're just going to need this few variables or these few variables to control what we're going to do connecting to the blockchain. So now is the time to actually set up the functionality to connect to our blockchain. Now let's get rid of these variables or this um, HTML down at the bottom because we're not going to use that immediately. We first want to create a function and this function is going to be called the init function. We're going to initialize this and on initialization, we're going to ask the person or the user 
to allow us to use his MetaMask to make the connection to the blockchain. The next part's going to be a bit technical, but please bear with me and you will understand because I'm going to talk through everything. I'm going to start off by creating a function and how we do that is by specifying a constant value and equaling it to an anonymous function. You write an anonymous function like this. This is the signature. This function is not going to only be anonymous but also asynchronous. This is because we need to wait for execution to finish inside of this function. Where do we call this function? Well, in React we also get a use effect hook. This is much the same like this use state hook that we've used, but this time we're going to import use effect. Use effect is a lifecycle hook that kicks off on the beginning of a component render and takes in dependencies to re-render whenever you tell it to. So we simply wanted to uh, basically render on the fly or when it starts off. So this is how you specify it. You pass it an anonymous function again and then these empty square brackets because we don't have any dependencies. I just simply want to call my initialization function over there. Let's check if this works. We're going to console.log and say this worked, like so. Once we have this, we can basically run our program by again typing npm run start and let's see the console. And there we go. Our app spun up and remember there's nothing inside the app at the moment because we took it out. But in the console you can see that we have a log and it says this worked. Perfect. Now we can go back and you can see that this initialization function gets kicked off once. But what do we want to do? We don't only want to console.log that. We actually want to create a connection to the blockchain via MetaMask. In order to do that, we need to first check that this browser contains the extension MetaMask. How can we do that? Well, the window object that the browser has, if you have the MetaMask extension, it injects an Ethereum object. So we can basically check for if this window, so let's talk through this, right? If this window has the Ethereum, so Ethereum dot, um, well, if it has the Ethereum object, basically, you can just check it like that. Um, or you can just say dot is meta mask, I believe. I think that's also something that MetaMask gives us, else do something, right? If we don't have MetaMask, what should we do? So let me just open these up. Let's console.log and say, you need MetaMask. And if we do have MetaMask, we can just say, you have MetaMask. How's that? So we're going to run this again this time I'm going to open the browser and check what it says. It tells me that I have MetaMask. Now, this is pretty interesting and um, I just want to show you how the Ethereum object looks. What you can do is go back and instead of just uh, console.logging that out, let's console.log the window.ethereum object as well. If we go back, you can see that we have MetaMask and this is how the object looks like. It has a handler with a target and, and to see what chain you are on and all these cool things about the blockchain. Now, what will happen if we open this in a new incognito tab? We can see that it cannot even read the isMetaMask variable. So, basically to resolve this, and I really do want to use this uh, MetaMask, so I'm going to add a question mark there. This allows us to check for this variable without breaking the application and then we can see that it says you need MetaMask. This is only for the incognito tab because in the incognito tab I don't have the MetaMask browser extension and that's exactly what we need. So let's close the incognito tab and see that everything is working as it should and let's continue on our journey. So now that we have this we don't simply want to log this out. Later on, we might need to use this information to communicate to the user that they need to install MetaMask. That's where it comes necessary to update our info state and in particular, this status variable. How can we do that? 
Well, maybe we can get rid of the console.log and say set info. This will set our state to something. Now, instead of just saying we want to set the status, because we can say status should equal um, you need MetaMask, and I don't know if that's the most friendliest message for someone, but anyway, you need MetaMask is there. Um, this will work, but it will override all the state. And we want to kind of keep all the state that is there currently and then basically update it. How do we do that with um, using the state? So basically what you can do is in here, we're going to extract all the state that was there before. And we can use the initial state in this instance. It will make sense in a second. I'm going to spread out the initial info state, put a comma, and this syntax basically says, take all of this and only update the status. So it will spread it out, it will put all those variables and then update the last one. Perfect. That's all that we need for the negative case. Because if there's no MetaMask, we can't really carry on with our app, seeing that this is a fully decentralized app. Let's work on our positive use case. So if we do have MetaMask, we don't only want to console or change the state immediately. We actually want to go and get the account that the user is now connected to and then the network ID. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is where the asynchronous um, kind of await comes in. So we need a new variable and I'm going to call it accounts. Then I'm going to equal the accounts to await. And what are we awaiting for? Well, in this instance, we're going to check for the window.ethereum. Okay. And then we need to send a request like so. This request will take in an object. So we're going to create it like this. And the object will take in a method um, like so. And then the method would be the request. Now there's different requests that we can use when it comes to MetaMask. Now the request that we are looking for is basically to see when we initialize the app, we want to get the accounts. Now that method looks like this. It says ETH and then request accounts like so. And that's basically it. Now you'll see that this function will wait for the accounts to get grabbed from MetaMask and then put it into this variable. We can log this out by saying uh, console.log accounts and you'll see that this returns an array. We are going to use the first one of the array, but let's first check it out like this. Save your file, go back to the app and here we can see is the array and the very first variable is actually my address. Perfect. It means we successfully grabbed my account from MetaMask. We can at this point save this account basically underneath our variable. But we still need a few other variables before we want to save it. So let's go ahead and grab the next one that we'll need. The next one would be the network ID. So it's the network ID like so. And you can call it whatever you want to. But this is again going to follow the exact same structure as this. So we can just copy and paste that. The only thing that changes is basically the method. And this method is called net version, like so. Now we'll get the network version, basically returning back the chain ID. Ethereum is chain one, and then for instance, Polygon uh, mainnet is 137. But this is basically what we need in order for us to connect to our contract on the blockchain. So the next thing that we want to do is basically check that we are indeed on this network. Because if we not, we want to ask the user to switch to a different network. So what we can do is include another if statement, this time checking for the network ID if it's equal to either one, which is the Ethereum mainnet, or four, which is the Rinkeby test network. I'm going to choose four because we are going to be working with the test network and I want to make sure that the person is on the test network. So if here, um, if we are here, we can continue doing our stuff, connecting, else we actually want to inform the user through setting our status again. So I'm just going to simply copy and paste that and say 
um, you need to be on the theorem test net. That's perfect. All right. So I'm going to say you need to be on the Ethereum test network if this is not true. And if it is true, we can actually now go and continue because now we know that we actually are on the right network. We know that we have MetaMask. So now it's time to actually create uh, the connection to basically uh, the Ethereum using our provider uh, and then uh, connect and create an instance of our contract so we can interact with it. At this point, we are going to make use of these two imports that we have at the top. So inside of this if statement, we're going to create a new variable. And this time I'm going to call it Web3 with a lowercase w. I'm going to equal it to a new Web3 object and this time pass it in a provider. Remember, our gateway to the blockchain is our Ethereum kind of node through MetaMask. So this is why we pass window.ethereum basically passing MetaMask's um, provider, right? Let's set the info again. And this time we're going to basically do exactly the same. Um, we can technically set it to the previous state by doing dot, 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 basically spreading it out, putting info over there, and then just updating the necessary variables, which would mainly be our contract that we need to define now. But I'm going to put it to the initial state because um, this is your initialization of the application and we probably want to just clear everything out and connect the user. There's two things that I want to set. I want to set the account and I also want to um, set the contract. So the account and the contract. Now remember, we do have the account via the accounts array on index zero. So let's just go ahead and set that. And then we're going to use our Web3 instance to say that we need a new uh, we need a new Web3 contract. Now, how you specify that is by saying Web3.eth and then contract, like so. And how you initialize it, this needs two variables. Firstly, it needs the ABI and the address. Now, remember that we created this contract.json, which contains basically the ABI and the address. This is where it comes in handy. So we are already importing it there. So I'm going to copy that, go all the way down, and firstly, pass in contract.abi, then contract.address. And that's it. We are done. Now we have, or we should have a connection to our MetaMask. And we also should have the contract now saved inside our info object. We are logging it out. So let's go and verify it on the console. We can see that as the application spins up, I'm going to refresh. We can see that this object that we have has everything null and false for connected. Now, obviously connected is still false. So basically let's also just set that. So connected is going to be equal to true. Let's jump back. Let's refresh and see now everything is default. And then the next update, because it could connect, we get the account, which is indeed my account. If I verify this, it ends with a 240D. This ends with 240D. We are connected and we have an instance of the contract. Here we go. This instance will have access to the methods that we can call when we query our app. Now, as well as this, we also have no status because nothing broke, okay? So uh, everything is good. We have our connection and now we should be able to read data from this contract. Something worth mentioning is what happens when someone switches their account. How do we reload this page? Well, we can actually listen for an event. So let's go and create this variable or another function basically. And let's call it init on uh, changed like so. This init on change basically is going to look for changes in our MetaMask activity. Basically things like changing accounts and so on. The Ethereum object on the window does give us that functionality to listen for changes. Firstly, let's also just verify over here that we do indeed 
have the window.ethereum object, otherwise it will break if we don't. Then we can say window.ethereum.on and the dot on will listen to an event. The event we want to listen to is if the accounts change, like so. Now this will kick off a function, so we can pass in the function that we want it to kick off. And what would we like this function to basically do? Well, for simplicity's sake, you can do a bunch of stuff. But for now, let's go ahead and say window.location.reload. This will reload the page. But this is not the only listener we want. We also want to see if the chain changed. So not only if the account changed, but also the chain. So we can just do this and both will reload. Now, where would we like to call this event listeners? Or where would we like this to kick off? Well, we can simply kick it off right here at the bottom where we have our use effect, where we initialize. We can also kick this off like so. Once we do this, check what will happen. I go into Chrome and let's reload the page and there it reloaded. Now, if I reload, you can see it kicks off and does all these checks. But now if I go to MetaMask and I update my chain and let's go to maybe the Polygon chain, check what happens. It reloads and it now says you need to be on the Ethereum testnet. And this is exactly what we want. So now if I go back to the Rinkeby test network, everything is fine and we have our connection. This is great. So this is all we need and now we are ready. The next step is to actually load up some data inside of our contract. Remember, this is the contract that we created, the Hashlips Hunter contract. Now, we've got some read and write functionality on this contract. I want to pass in some data with the write contract method. Technically, we are going to do this through the DAP, but for now, I need to just pass in or add a drop at least so I can see that I can read the data from my contract. If we go back to the contract, remember we had some test data that we commented down here? Well, I'm going to use this data. I'm going to copy this, go to my app and just simply paste it. Then I'm going to remove the comments just so that I have some clean data to work with. Cut this out again. And now that I have it in my clipboard, I can go back and write to this contract. Now I need to make sure that I am on the Rinkeby test network, which I'm pretty sure I am. And then I can go ahead and connect. Let me connect through MetaMask and I'm just going to say, that's fine. We'll connect with this one. Just make very sure that you are connected to the site. Otherwise it won't work. Now let's go and add a drop by pasting in this tuple. I'm going to specify my square brackets and then paste my data inside of it. So you have to wrap the data in square brackets and let's say write. It's going to ask me for a transaction and I'm going to say yes. If we take a look at our transactions, we can see that our transaction has now gone through successfully. Now, what we can do is actually read from the contract and check that data out. So if we go ahead and query the drops, we can see that, boom, there's um, our image URI and we need to, well, this is the actual struct and we need to query. So let's query uh, number zero. And if we call it, we can see there's all of our data. Perfect. Now we don't wanna do the drops like this. We wanna call this get drops and this will actually return to us a list of tuples. So uh, what does it say here? Test of PNG, this collection. So it actually returns to us the whole list um, in its own format, but this is something we will actually now use in our DAP. What I would like to do though, is actually go back to writing to the contract and doing this again, this time not pasting that. Let's just go back here. Let me grab this data again, like so, and let me remove it. I'm just going to add one more because I want to see uh, if we can pull in different data. So this is my, uh, my test two, like so. Now we need to be connected. So let's connect. And now once we connected, let's just add it. 
and kick off this transaction. Now for the next part, and this is actually reading this data from the contract, not from Etherscan, but from our own DAP. And that would be easy to do. We already have our connection to our contract. So now let's set up a function that we can kick off and wait for the data to be returned so we can list them on our DAP. We at least need some valid data. I'm talking about the image. We at least need the image to be live hosted somewhere in order for it to render. So here you can see I've got under hashlips.online, I've got a test image. So let me go back to the program or the contract and let me go and update the drop. So now what I need to do is paste exactly the same data over here that I want to update as well as the index. I have to stay on the owner of this drop which I already am. Now before I update this, let me just grab the proper URI, which is this one. So I'm going to place it in there, like so, and then click right. Perfect. I've gone ahead and updated the other one as well. So now when we call the get drops, we get two tuples, which is basically our two drop structs. Now we're ready to pull this into the DAP. In order to read data from the blockchain, we can create a new function. So let's go ahead and remove this console.log and write const. And our function is going to be maybe get info, or we can call it something like get drops, which is also pretty cool. So now that we have the get drops method on our uh, front end, we can go and specify a function and then in this function, it's not going to take anything, but we are going to make it asynchronous. Again, we need to wait for the blockchain to return some data to us. Grabbing data from the blockchain after setting up a connection is fairly simple. All you need to do now is get access to your contract, which we already have, by going to the info.contract, saying methods.getDrops, because that is the method that we want to call. And then after that, you say call. This means that it's going to call it and then await for the data to be returned. Now you can put a wait before this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say then result, right? So we're going to take the result and then do something with the result. This time I'm going to uh, just log it out. So let me log out the result and let's also cater for if something goes wrong. So let's just catch it. So we need to say dot catch and then we can just simply do something with the error. For now, I'm also going to just log it out. You can gracefully handle errors like this. This is similar to using the await uh, method like we've done here where we basically await for a result to come back and wrap it in an if statement or a try catch block. But um, you can also do it like this. Now, once we have it, we need to call the get drops. So down here in my divs, I'm just going to create a quick button for us to use. So I'm going to say this is get uh, drop, get drops. And we're going to create a click handler and the function that we want to call is actually our local get drops. Perfect. Let's hope for the best and see if we get those drops back. So if I go to my DAP now, there's my button. And if I click on it, there we go. Boom. There's our first one. And you can see it has all of the uh, fields as well as my second one. We can see that this returns an array for us with some elements. Now, I think it is time so that we can at least render this on the screen. So we're going to do a basic render of this and let's see how we can do it using more state. So right here at the top, let's create a state variable and let's call it maybe something like drops. So we are going to create a variable. Uh, this is going to be our drops. We're also going to have a set drops. And we're also going to say this is use state like so. For the initial value, I'm going to have two variables. I'm going to have a loading because whenever we get drops, I want this variable to be true. So on start, it's going to be false. 
and then we actually need the drops. So I'm going to actually call this the list and this will be an empty array. Let's follow best practices like we are doing here at the top and create some initial state. I'm going to say this is the initial drop state and uh, we didn't do the state part here, which is fine. I just want to clearly define that this is state. Um, but anyway, it's up to you. You can call this whatever you like. I am ever going to take this whole object and cut it out and put it in here. Then we are going to initialize with our initial drop state. Now you can see that this list is empty and we want to populate it. So let's go and set the drops. Whenever we call get drops and instead of console.logging the result, we want to set the drops to a new object. We want to basically set this to the initial state or let's think about this for a second. We probably want this to be the drop state, which is the current drops that we have. Plus, we want to update the list to be the result, like so. Now, this means that it will take in the current drop state. We also then need to make loading to false. So, uh, therefore, we don't need that at all. If this fails, I would simply like to reset this to the initial state. And that's why I made it a state variable at the top. Awesome. Now, before we carry on, I would like to do one more state update. And this is going to happen before everything kicks off. Now, I'm going to do it like this, where I specify the previous um, state, like so. And then I want it to return to me an object. So I just need to get rid of all these things. Let's cut this out. Let's get rid of that. Let's add this in like so. And the reason why I'm doing this is so that we get to return this, but I want the previous state to be spread out first. The reason for that is so that let's say there was already things loaded and we just want to refresh, we can then get the drops and it will show the previous list as well as the new list. So it would almost just merge them. Perfect. This is awesome. So now that we have this, we are saving it in state. And in React, when state updates, it re-renders, meaning that we can now take this data and render it on the screen. Now, let me show you the true power of React. Inside here where the HTML is written, I'm going to create a, just a, a line break and then we're going to try and render our list. But what we are going to do first is create a P tag uh, like so. And the reason for this is for us just to say something is loading. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify my curly braces and say if my drops dot loading, meaning that if the state is true, with a question mark, show this. Else, I'm simply going to say, don't show anything. So I just want to show you this small example that if we alter the state, which this function does, it will then show the loading um, text. So let's go there. Let's click on get drops and you'll see that it should say loading. Now, the reason why it's not doing that is because Let's just make sure that we're setting the loading to true up here, uh, like so. And then go back and then click uh, get drop. So you see it's a quick flash. Um, that might be very quick. So I don't even know if that's necessary. That's super quick. We will leave it in there anyway, even though it is a bit fast. Now we have the option to, instead of returning null, we can do what we are going to be doing now but I'm going to keep them in separate states so that you can just get the hang of using React. Now we're going to open and close another curly braces and this time I'm going to focus on the drops for this time the list. I'm going to map over the items and then inside here I'm going to specify that we have the item. And what should we do with the item? 
Well, we first of all need to return something. So I'm going to say we need to return and let's just return a P tag for now. P tag is stands for paragraph, by the way. And let's just return hello. This is a simple example, but you'll see where I'm getting with this. So now if I say get drops, you can see there's two hellos. These hellos basically uh, represent each of these items. So instead of saying hello, we can basically go and drill down and get this information. So let me just copy this for a brief second to paste it in the code as a comment so that we can see what we are dealing with. So I'm just going to comment this out so we can make use of these variables in our item. Check how cool this is. Because we have access to each item, what we can basically do now is rather than just return um, th that simple p tag, we can return a few. Okay, so I'm just going to return a few like this and then we can save them like so. Let me just wrap this in a div. Perfect. And let's go ahead and do a few things. So I'm going to grab the description. I also want to grab the name. We can grab pre-sale. Um, this is actually the time that the pre-sale starts. So uh, let's, group, let's group them together. What else do we need? We need this supply. I'm going to render the supply over there. And um, what else? The socials. So let's actually render the socials as well. So we need these. Uh, we don't need all of them for now, but I just want to show you how it's going to work. So I want to kind of just list them out so that we know also what they are. Like so. And then I'm going to put my curly braces and basically put whatever is in there um, over here. But I can't just say name. This time I have to say item dot name because we are referencing something that's coming back from the back end. So we referencing this. We will see what's happening here in just a second. For now, just know that you need to say item dot name, item dot description and so on. Okay, so I'm going to copy and paste this quickly in there. And then just update these. All right, perfect. Okay, so now we're ready to uh, rock. Now, what this basically is doing is it's saying for each one of these drops in the list, map over it and basically return to me the list. But we are returning it over here, okay? And this is returning this data set. So if I save this, check what happens. If I reload my page, I can see that when I click on drops, I get back both of my tuples or so to called drops. And this is the information that's needed to display to a user to tell them exactly when a drop is going to take place. So technically, we are halfway there uh, in completing this DAP. The only thing that's really needed now is to kind of render the image, make it look nice, and then as well create a form for us to push more data to it. Like I said, we probably want to render the image. So you can just specify an image tag, give it some alt text if you want to, and specify and say this is um, drop image. And then the source is going to be um, coming from the item. And what did we specify this as? Image URI. So this is going to be the image URI and then we can end it off. I'm also going to add, give it some style because uh, without style it's going to look quite uh, big. So for now we're not going to focus on styling just yet but let's just give it a style of like 40 by a height of 40 as well. Okay. And that's perfect. So now if we go back um, to our DAP, we'll get to this in just a second, but you can see there is our two images. 
Okay, and that is cool. The next step that we want to do, and I kind of pre-revealed it a bit, but that is looking at implementing a form. Now, forms in React is quite simple, but what simpler way is there than using a library? Now, this React hook form is a simple library for us to just hook up a form very easily. All you need to do is use this npm install script to install it. So let's go ahead and do that first. I'm going to click command C to end my program and then install react hook form. You can basically use any form, any means to get data from the user so that we can add a drop to our contract. So after installing this, we're going to implement the simple form and just see if we can upload a drop from our site. After installing, I'm going to go ahead and read the documentation quickly. So they want us to basically include this form in the import. So we're going to do that, we're going to put it there at the top. Then we're going to go back and I see that they want us to basically uh, create this as well as another constant on submit to do some error or some logging basically of the data. So let's go and copy these two things. Let's go up to our state. Let's add that state. And this is a function, so I'm not going to leave it up there, uh, but I'll bring it down here like so. This is what's going to happen when we submit our data. Then they have an example form for us over here, which I'm going to copy, but just that part because I just need that. And then let's maybe paste it right after this. Like I said, we'll worry about styling in just a second. For now, let's try and render this out and see if it even works. So let's go back to our DAP and let's refresh. Remember to run npm run start for it to spin up the local server. And there we go. There's our form. So now it doesn't have labels, but I presume this is now my name and surname and I think this is the age, so I'm going to say, okay, cool, I'm 29, and submit. We can see that we now get this object logged out, and we have the age, the first name, and last name. And if we can recall, what we need to pass through whenever we upload something to our blockchain, especially when we go and check the right method, remember, we need to pass in an array with all the values. So we can probably construct this from this, um, basically this object after getting and collecting all the data that we need. So I've now gone ahead and completed this form. Now it's a very basic form, so I'm just going to slowly go down so that you can maybe pause the video and have a look at what I've done. But in essence, I've just added a label and focused on a single input. There is no validation uh, kind of checks happening that I'll leave up to you guys to, you know, explore the app and make it a lot better. Uh, for me, the whole purpose is to just show you exactly how to pull data and push data uh, to the blockchain via the connection, because that's essentially what a dApp is. But needless to say, this is our simple form and it has all the fields that we need down here. Where I got this from, was by going back to our contract and then looking at our drop and exactly what the order was. Now, this is how our form is going to kind of be set up. And this is how it looks so far. It's very ugly, but <laughs> we will make it pretty very soon. And uh, the next thing that we need to do is kind of read all this data. If we submit this, we can see that indeed we get this object, which is now empty. Um, but we get this object. So our first mission is to kind of take this object and reiterate or iterate over it and take all the values and put it into an array so that we can then call it and call our add drop function. This is great, but we see a problem. Not all of the values that we need to pass are strings. Some of them are numeric values. So we need to go and map this data before we push it to the blockchain. Let's focus on our onSubmit function and go and remove that. Open curly braces 
let's create a new data variable put the curly braces and paste in that over there now we can see that at least we have some sort of structure over here I'm going to just add all the commas and I got this data from uh, Chrome's console just like this there we go this should be the data that's kind of represented over here from our form but we need to double check that it is indeed all the data that we got from our contract we also need to make sure that it all falls in the same format so down here I'm going to have a look at this and then we see that we need image your eye at the top then we will need uh, the name so let's just put the image your eye at the top we're going to take the name cut it out put it there then the description put it there and so on I'm gonna do this and then uh, pause the video quickly the data is now organized in the order that they want them I also gone ahead and added the approve uh, field because that's something that we need in our struct otherwise the application will not accept this data we can now technically get rid of this because this was just for reference we still need to only get the values in an array how can we do that well we can use object.keys to get the keys but we can also use object.values to get all the values in an array the first thing that we need to do though is extract some of these elements or some of these variables in this order so we need to now say data it's going to be the image data and then we get the name which should be name description and so on you get the point but I am going to do this with you because I need to show you that some of these fields we need to actually change into num numeric values numbers so I'm going to change this then quickly just replace and these are all strings so they are fine even the supply well actually the supply starts to be numeric values now what we need to do is let's wrap this and cast this as a number okay uh, number like so by doing this we are telling JavaScript to take whatever this input is and create a number of it. So we have to make sure to input numeric values in our form. This is something to do with validation, but that's fine. We're not going to focus on that right now. Next, what we can do is let me just console.log what we will have. So I'm going to say console.log um, the new data, but not only the new data. We want to say object.values and then we want to pass the new data. When we save this, let's go back to the browser and click on submit. And now you can see that the array actually considers this to be uh, numeric values and it makes it a zero. There are numerous ways of doing things in JavaScript. This is one way how we can map it to the data that we need and then cast it into an array. Now, that being said, the last thing or the last step we need to do is basically post this to our blockchain and create a transaction. We can do that because we already have done this before. I'm going to copy this line of code in the get drops function and paste it down here. Basically, we need to now change the get drops to add drop. Like so. We're going to change the call into send because this is a transaction. And we're going to put in curly braces and create a from field. The from field is basically going to be who is this from? And we have that because we have access to our account that the person's MetaMask is connected to. So we're going to do that and that should be it. We need to remember to in add drops pass the variables, the array. So that's why I'm going to take this, cut it out and paste it in there and get rid of this console.log so now that we have this we can basically test this out I've gone ahead and filled in some of the values in our form I filled in 
all the Hashlib's details such as an image URI, where it's living, the name, description, Twitter, Discord, website, as well as the price, supply, and now I'm busy with the pre-sale and sales variables. To get a timestamp, what you can do is go to this website, enter in a day, maybe say day six, and then grab the milliseconds timestamp of that. This is how I'm doing it. Then for the chain, it's going to be on Ethereum. Let's just pretend it is. And we're going to say uh, chain one. Now let's go and submit. We will see that MetaMask wants us to create a transaction. And I'm going to go ahead and confirm this. We will see if this goes through and then query it again on our drops. So for now, let's go back to Etherscan. When we look at Etherscan, we can see that this indeed went through successfully. We can also click on the transaction and see what happened. Now we can see the data that was passed through over there and everything looks good. So if we click on get drops now, we should get all of our data back. And indeed we do. Check it out. We get the first two that we've added manually on Etherscan, as well as the one that we've just added through our DAP through the form. Now, this is cool and all, and all the functionality is done, but this app looks ugly. So we need to now work a bit on styling, and that's what we are going to do. I'm going to show you how to basic, uh, do basic styling so that you can get used to working with CSS, JSX, how to style in React, and it's going to be super fun. So let's jump into that and let's give this page a bit more styling. We need to remember to remove these two state changes because we're not setting the drops. We're simply sending it. Remember, this is the send function. I forgot to remove them, but they're not needed. And if you leave them in there, it will break the app. So take them out and we should be ready to style. Before we get into styling, I want to say thank you for watching this video to this point. Please leave a like, a comment and subscribe if you haven't and you want to see more awesome content like this. Lastly, if you're struggling, you can go and visit our Discord channel, which is great. So if you go to the website, all the links are here. Let's continue with CSS. Let's take a look at how we can structure the data first. Now we can use routes, which is perfectly fine, but I want to show you React tabs. This is a cool library that we can use to organize the data into different tabs. We mainly want a main tab and a tab for us to add more drops. So copy this line npm install and let's go to our program and then we're going to paste it in here at the bottom. Remember to exit the program in your terminal before doing this and let's install it. We can see that this library will help assist in organizing into different tabs. This is important for the beginner level because you can basically build this out with routes like I mentioned. But let's go ahead and use this. I'm going to go and import all this into my program. So I'm going to go there and import it like so. Now that we have the tab, the tabs, tab list and panels and the CSS that they recommend for the tabs imported, we can see what's next. They want us to create a tab section like so. So let's go and do the same. We're going to go down to where our program is and it's basically this part and then I'm going to paste this in here at the very top. I need to organize this data and uh, the reason why it's breaking is because JSX allows you to only ever export one component. Technically we're exporting more than one. So let's go and put these in the respective fields. Now I'm going to take everything from here and uh, let's see. Let's put everything from this button in the first panel. Then the form itself will be in its own panel. So I'm going to copy the form or cut the form and put it in this panel. Conveniently, they already have two panels for us on the boilerplate. If we now jump back to our DAP and refresh, we should see that this works. Remember, to first run your program by running npm run start. So once we run this program, it's going to implement all the changes and we should see some kind of tab happening. So there we go. 
we see that we've got our title one and title two. Title two now houses our form and where title one is the get drops and we can still load them. That's perfect. We just need to kind of center these a bit and change the styling of the tabs because they look quite plain. But we also need to remember to change the names. So a lot more to come. But we're going to do this section by section so that you truly understand how styling kind of works. I am going to do a course on CSS purely and you'll get used to using CSS. For now, just enjoy what we are doing and play around as you code along. We will need a space to save all of our styles. For now, we can just create a new folder and call it styles. In there, let's create a new file and call it styles.css like so. Now that we have this, let's go and import it in our app. So all we need to do is write import and then specify the path. So our path is going to be uh, one back, then go into the styles and then it's styles.css. To test if this worked, we can simply go to our styles and type in body and let's give it a style for the whole body and let's make the background color maybe aqua and let's save it. Let's go back to the dap. Let's refresh and see. Perfect. Our styles are hooked up and now we can play with it. Remember, our main goal is to get something similar. We want this kind of background color to be dark, some text if we need to, some descriptive text and then maybe a header. So instead of making the background aqua, let's go and choose a nice color. Let's choose like a deep blue, like so. Let's check it out. And this is going to be constantly going back and forth to check out our progress. That looks cool. Now let's create some kind of header section. So we can go back to our DAP and go to the HTML part. Let's see. Here at the very top, Let's create a new div. So we're going to create a div and we're going to give it a style. So this div is going to have some text. For now, I'm just going to add some text. So let's just do this. And I'm going to say hello. We'll work out the text and what we need to put there in just a second. This whole thing though, I need to wrap in a div as well. Otherwise, it won't work. So that's the beginning. And then here's the very end. Let's save that, go back and verify. There it is. In the styles file, I'm going to specify a header class. You specify classes with a dot in front of the word. I basically want to make the width full screen or full length. So I'm going to make it 100%. I'm going to give it another height. And this time I think it should be 60 pixels. Uh, maybe a bit smaller even, maybe 45 pixels. Now also I'm going to add a background color. This time I want it kind, kind of the same color as we have over here, just lighter. So I'm going to specify that and then I'm going to see if I can change this color over here. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to make it a bit more lighter like that going to save it and I need to go to my drop list and actually give it a class name. So I'm going to specify as uh, this as header like so. And now that it has the class on it, we can see it basically does what we need to, but we see this kind of weird padding. Now this is innate to HTML. It comes with this padding on the body and on the HTML. So let's go reset that. It's always a good practice to have a reset function, basically setting the margin and the padding to zero. So I'm going to also add the HTML in here because I don't mind the HTML also being that color, the background basically. But we also want to set the padding to zero like so. And let's just make it zero pixels. And then also we want to set the margin to zero pixels. Now if we save that and go back, we'll see that there's no margin and padding on the sides, but there's still a little bit here on the top. For that reason, I'm going to remove this out of here and then go to the very top 
and specify an asterisk. This will allow us to put the style on everything basically. So I want everything not to have a margin and not to have a padding. Now if we go back we can see that it's all cleared out. And that's perfect. Now we actually have our header and our two tabs. I want the header to have a little bit of padding, have white text and maybe say something different like NFT Hunter. Let's go and do the changes. I'm firstly going to change this to an H1 um, or maybe an H3 will suffice. Then I'm going to say this is our uh, NFT Hunter. Well, let's call it NFT Drop Hunter and that's good. Let's now change the color to be white and I'm actually going to choose this Alice blue. That looks awesome. So let's go back. You can see it's white. Then we're going to go ahead to go back to Visual Studio Code in our styles and add some padding. We want to add padding because we don't want it to be too close to the side. So I'm going to add 10, uh, 10 pixels for the top and the bottom and then 25 pixels for the left and the right. If I save that, go back, I can see that indeed we have some padding over there which is bigger than the top and the bottom. But it's not centered and we have this awkward size. So I've got two options here. I can either take away my height, save this, and it will collapse in on itself, which is good. But there's also a way where we can use flex direction. For now, I'm just going to leave it like that and make the padding control the height. So that's perfect. Now let's focus on this whole section over here. I'm going to go back to my drop list and then let's create a new div. See a div as a container and you can use containers to containerize things. So we got our outer div and then we get this extra div over here. This div is going to be the content. So I actually am going to give it a class name and call it content, like so. Then we're going to add the style, maybe below the header. For the content, I also wanted to have some padding. But this time, I'm going to add the padding 25 pixels all around. That way, we actually get a nice alignment over there and we still get to see our things. I now want to go ahead and see if I can override the color to be this Alice blue as well. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but it did. And the reason I wasn't sure before is because I was worried that the underlying styles of the tabs was going to overwrite it. But this looks good. When we click on get drops, we can see that it loads in our drops and there they are. But they look extremely ugly. So let's go ahead and style it so that it's maybe organized in a row and uh, see how that looks. We also need to make the image a bit better and let's round the image even. I'm not sure what we're going to do, but we are going to make it look a bit better. All right, let's go ahead and do so. We need to start off by actually structuring the data or the actual content and how we want it to look inside of our HTML. So let's go and define the structure. We can take a look at how Rarity Tools structured theirs. I see that they have their name description over there, then the image, and then the data over here. So let's do the same. We have to create a container for this to save the name as well as the description and image. And then we need two more containers. So if we go back, let's start containerizing everything. So we need another div in our structure which we're going to define as the image div basically. So we need the image, name and description in here. We also need the name and the description to be on top of the image. And then let's take out the style completely and let's maybe give it a class name rather. We can say this is going to be our, uh, I don't know, image or drop. I think drop image would be fine. We can go to our styles and in here just define what our drop image would be looking like. Let's specify a width and a height. So the width, maybe we can create it as 200 pixels for now. Let's save it and see how it looks. That looks a bit better. It's a bit bigger. Um, we can get away with that, I think, for now. 
we want to keep the name here at the top and the description as well. Now in our drop list, we see that we are defining them by name and description. We really don't need that seeing that obviously people will just read what it is. We can maybe have stuff like the supply, but let's just call it total supply like so. And then the sale date. Let's do this. So the sale date. And maybe for this one, we'll have the pre-sale date. Perfect. But we still need to go ahead and we call, can't call this social. So we can say this is our Twitter and this is our Discord. Like I said, we need more containers over here. So let's specify a new container with a div. And what do we need to put in here? Well, I would like to put in the two social medias in there, seeing that that is how Rarity Tools are doing it. Um, seeing that we just want to do basic styling and keep to what they have. They also have the total supply and then the start date and the pre-sale date. So pre-sale should probably come before start date, like so. Let's cut that out and also put it in a container. And that looks pretty cool. Now we need to structure it so that it all is structured in a row. So what we're going to do now is go to style and this is the content. Let's call this the drop container like so. In here, we're going to say this needs to display flex. And then because we are saying display flex, it would be automatically going into a row. So once we have this, I'll just show you, I can save this and put it as this class over here, class name, specify this as the drop container. This should go and list these in a row like so. And there you can see it is indeed doing that. There's our first container, second one and third one. Let's go ahead and change the whole font family to something else as well. Now, anything would look better than the other one. So maybe this um, should work well. And then if it can't find uh, Lucida Sands, and then it will check for the next one, then Vihendra. I actually like Vihendra the most. So I'm just going to specify Vihendra. And then for the rest, I'm pretty sure it's going to have Vihendra. So let's just go back and we can see that the text looks way better. We also want the content to stretch the full length. So for this, we can basically create the width to 100% or flex it as one, whichever you prefer. We also going to maybe give it a different background color. So let's give it a background color. And again, I'm going to choose this because I want to use the shade all over the place. Then I'm going to specify maybe an even darker color for this. I'm also going to add a padding and I can basically add a padding all around. That's awesome. And then for the flex, um, for the alignment of items. So this time we need to justify the content to space between. Like so. Once we have this, you can see that already this is now space between but it's not really aligned. To align the items, all we need to do is say align items center. I also wanna create a text. Basically, let's call this the drop text. Now the drop text, only the only thing I need there basically is a margin bottom. So let's go and say margin bottom and it's gonna be about five pixels. The reason why I want this is so that it at least gives a little bit of space. We can do much more with this, but for now, let's go and do that. So I'm going to add it over here. And I also want this to be there, there, and there. Now, sometimes this is a bit more redundant. So you can just basically target the P tag in the div class, but let me just make it explicit. So if we go back, you can see that it is now a bit more spaced out. Let's make the text a bit smaller as well. Maybe a font size of 15 pixels will look a bit better. 
then I want to darken this color even further because we can't really see it. I also give it a border radius of maybe 15 or 20 pixels as well as my image. So the image is over here. So I'm going to do that as well. Let's save it and see. This looks way better. But now we can see that we need some spacing over here as well as between each one of these drops. How we can achieve this is by actually going, and I just want to make this a little bit lighter, is by actually going to this drop and we can now either go ahead and create some space at the bottom or put a margin. So maybe let's put a margin bottom and this time I'm going to say uh, 50 pixels. Let's save it. Let's see. And there we go. Now we get some margin at the bottom. We still have this here at the top that is very close, but that is fine because we'll put something in there just now. Let's go back to our drop list markup and then let's see this tab. So we got this loading and then before everything starts, let's add another div. I'm just simply going to use this div as a spacer. So I'm going to give it some style and this time I'm going to say it's going to have a height of 50 pixels like so. Uh, I'm just going to say 50 in there. I also want to specify that there needs to be some kind of space between the description and the image. Probably doesn't have to be that big, but maybe 20 would be good. And there we go. This looks fine. Now let's go and have a look at if we can get away with calling the drops the whole time. I don't want to refresh and there's nothing there. And then I have to click on drops. How we can achieve this is basically by getting rid of this get drops. We also don't really need the loading for now because it loads super fast. Maybe we'll need it later again. And then what we want to do is instead of just instantiating it like that, we want to create another use effect. This use effect is basically going to be there for us to check whether the contract is there. So if we can check if info, so let's put a if statement. If the info dot has a contract, meaning that we are basically connected to the blockchain, then go and get our drops. And this should happen every time that info updates. Perfect. So let's leave it like that. Let's go back to our site. Let's refresh. And you can see that immediately it goes and gets our drops. And that is basically it. A few things that we can still do is stuff like display the timestamp in a nice readable format add a section for the admin to go ahead and approve some of these drops before they get displayed to the user, work on the actual form because that looks a bit ugly still, <laughs> but it comes down to the gist of it. I'm not going to spend hours of doing CSS and making this video super long. I'll leave that up to you to experiment and try out. But I hope in this video I have explained it enough for you to get excited and let me know in the comments if you would like to see me do a full on CSS tutorial. That being said, I hope you got the gist of it of how to create a dApp with this whole series. So let me know in the comments. I do read them and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to never miss a moment. And I want to say thank you to the 18,000 subscribers of my channel. You guys are awesome. If you are struggling with any of the content, like I said, go to my website and then go to Discord or Telegram. There's many devs that will help you out. Lastly, stay tuned on this channel because something exciting is going to happen. There is something brewing and I cannot wait to share the news with you guys. So please stay tuned. Go and check on Discord and Twitter. I'll definitely communicate what's going to be happening in the next few months and it's going to be exciting. So see you guys in the next video.